Honor. Speaker, um, I, I'd acknowledge that speech from that member who is an enthusiastic new member. It's a shame he didn't stick to the facts. Um, it would have made a bit of difference. Mr Speaker, can I refer to a sobering IMF report just done on the New Zealand economy that says New Zealand stands, stands out as having one of the lowest savings rates and one of the largest net foreign liability positions of any advanced country, Mr Speaker. And the National Government last budget cut all efforts in terms of savings. See, Kiwi Saver, superannuation fund, they cut it. Mr Speaker, what then did they do this year? Well, we've heard some pearls of wisdom in the House today, Mr Speaker. Just quoting today from Mr English, he says, we need to create jobs in the export sectors. He says, we need a growing, tradable sector. Mr Speaker, I agree with those statements. However, on the other hand, we've had Sir Roger Douglas from Act there saying, we need to reduce taxation dramatically in this country, Mr Speaker. And then for Mr Dunn saying, we need liberating policies. Well, if we were to think that these three parties work together as a government, then there'd be some cohesion and some kind of logical outcome from all those statements, Mr Speaker. So I ask the question, what did the budget do to promote those statements, if indeed they do believe them, Mr Speaker? Well, at the Select Committee, of course, one of the senior ministers, uh, Jerry Brownlee, was asked, what growth targets does the government ha have? He could not admit to any growth targets in the Select Committee, Mr Speaker, because the government, in fact, doesn't have any. Mr Speaker, if I can go back to those, those statements in the House today, I'm not going back any further, just today, what did the budget do for taxation? If we are to believe that lower taxes and do drive a better economy, Mr Speaker, as Mr Dunn, perhaps through liberating, maybe he believes that the flat tax, like a flat earth, is the nirvana that we should all seek, Mr Speaker, or that no tax, in fact, delivers a perfect world. Well, it doesn't. We know that. So let's go back in the belief, the naive belief that lower taxes deliver a better economy, Mr Speaker. Well, in fact, tax went up for every single New Zealander in the last budget. GST is going up to 15%. Every single item you buy in this country, Mr Speaker, will cost more because of increased taxation. Oh, there were cuts to taxation, cuts that delivered one-third of the total benefits to 5% of the taxpayers in this country, Mr Speaker. They were unfair, Mr Speaker. If you go through and look at the cuts, if you're at the lower end, 0 to 14,000, you've got a 2% cut in taxation. Moving up to 48 to 70, you've got a 3% cut. And if you're on the highest levels, over 70,000, you got a 5%, Mr Speaker, you got a 5% cut to your tax, Mr Speaker. It was simply unfair, unethical, and in my view, Mr Speaker, immoral. So there were tax cuts to a small number of people, but those people at the bottom, bottom end who got less, Mr Speaker, will have any benefits of that gobbled up through, as I say, increased GST, electricity costs going up, an inflation that the budget admitted would be at 5.9% by July of next year, Mr Speaker. That will cripple many, many people, Mr Speaker. Mr Dunn was wrong. We're, there were no liberating policies in the last budget, Mr Speaker. And in fact, tax didn't go down as, as Sir Roger Douglas would demand. It went up for the vast majority of New Zealanders. Mr Speaker... If we were to believe that lower taxes deliver better outcomes, why then do the countries, Finland, Denmark, the European countries, that have strong, sustainable growth, high incomes, Mr Speaker, good investment in R&D, why are they better off than the low-tax countries, Mr Speaker, which are New Zealand, and the IMF says we're not that great looking forward. We've got some serious issues around savings, Mr Speaker, and net debt. We are a so-called low-tax country. Well, Mr Speaker, the budget did not deliver a more sustainable future for New Zealand. It taxed the lower-income New Zealanders more, and it cut taxes to people at the higher end, Mr Speaker. Well, let's look at the tradable sector. If we are to believe, and I do agree with Bill English, we need to drive growth in the tradable sector. What did the budget do for the export sector, Mr Speaker. Well, I think 
it's widely acknowledged that we need more investment and research and development, Mr Speaker. What happened that we had a commitment of $700 million to research and development in the tradable sector and the government swiped the money and came back with a primary growth partnership proposal that did nothing for 18 months, Mr Speaker. Absolutely nothing for 18 months. That's right. Not one dollar out of the primary growth partnership for 18 months. There has just been three grants made. Mr Speaker, what happened is that we had research and development tax credits in place. Every single business in this country could claim tax credits for research and development. The government, the national government, wiped them out, Mr Speaker, took them away, and they've implemented a research and development grants program. Well, that's as bureaucratic as you can possibly get, Mr Speaker. From the party that claimed to be stomping on bureaucracy, they replaced tax credits, tax cuts for research and development with a bureaucracy that delivers, if you're lucky, some grants for research and development. That is not the way to drive this economy forward for the export sector, Mr Speaker. We had quite recently, Mr Bollard, increase the cash rate, Mr Speaker. He put it up 0.25 of a percent, and that will do more to harm the tradable sector in the medium term than any benefit, any policy that the national government passed through the budget, Mr Speaker, because we will see and already are seeing the value of the dollar climb, Mr Speaker, because we've increased interest rates, they flow across the board, we're seeing the dollar climb, and the export sector will get punished once again. I acknowledge the work that is going into the monetary policy reform that we will put on the table, Mr Speaker, through Mr Cunner, through Mr Parker, a lot of good work going on, because we know the export sector cannot continue to be battered around by, by a fluctuating dollar, by interest rates rising, and they will rise as they did in the 90s under the national government, Mr Speaker, because the export sector that Bill English said we need to grow will be hammered as we move forward, Mr Speaker. Another area where the government could have assisted with the export sector were depreciation allowances, Mr Speaker. Depreciation incentives for new plant and equipment. The government eliminated them, took them away. If ever, there's an, if ever there's a way of increasing productivity is to encourage businesses to invest in new technology and new plant, Mr Speaker. And the government took away that incentive. In fact, you could say they created a perverse incentive because they lowered the company tax rate. And what we're likely to see is that businesses that have an option of taking money out through dividends or reinvesting back in higher levels of productivity will take it out because they pay less tax on it now. That is a bizarre policy for a government that says it's encouraging the tradable sector. The next area, of course, that we do need to invest in is in infrastructure, Mr Speaker. So what did the government do in this area? It, sh it shrunk the increasing in in money going into health, Mr Speaker, to a point where the rural areas are now suffering cuts in home care, Cuts to aged care facilities, Mr Speaker. Threats to the services that support the people that drive this export economy, Mr Speaker. In education, can I quote from a principal of a school, Mr Speaker, in short, I feel that the 2010 budget will do absolutely nothing to assist, and I take out the high school, and this particularly irksome, is particularly irksome when the Prime Minister has stated that one of, quote, one of the government's top priorities is ensuring that a greater proportion of education funding goes to frontline services in our schools and less into bureaucracy. It says, I can say categorically that it won't. That is from a principal of a high school in a rural area, Mr Speaker. He knows the truth because the government has refused to properly fund education through this budget that might support people who live out in the rural areas and produce the export income. Income. Mr Speaker, in communication, we committed $48 million, and what's the government done? It said we will take a levy off all other broadband users and put it back into a $300 million fund for rural broadband. Compared to $1.5 billion the government's spending in the cities, that will not help the tradable sector, Mr Speaker. Neither will roading, where they've chopped money from 
provincial roads that are in the control of councils to put into the Sergeant projects Rupp, around the, the 